Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, Montgomery County Council continues its war on cars while Alexandria battles single-family housing. Governor Moore releases additional funds to fight increase in hate crimes. And should businesses be required to pay for feminine hygiene products? Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by former House of Delegate member and attorney Marise Morales and Stacey Sauter, a member of the Montgomery County Republican Central Committee. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. This week, the Montgomery County Council expressed unanimous support, meaning all 11 members for support for a zoning change that would limit the number of parking spaces when building new homes near public transportation. Uh, Initiated as a means of reducing the cost of constructing new housing, the proposed bill would allow developers to build new housing without providing parking for automobiles, if you're within a half mile of Metro or a quarter mile of an existing bus stop, Marase, the reluctance to use public transportation has been as its highest in the last 18 years as a result of the pandemic. Some 54% of respondents said safety was a top consideration, and only 43% agreed said that they would use their cars less if public transportation was improved. What's going on here? Why is the council doing this? (laughs) The war on cars, huh, Casey? You know, it's great to see your impartiality in terms of the questioning here. But if you think about it, 43% is actually a pretty uh, good percentage, okay? Especially because after the pandemic, we have people that are now thinking about working remotely, et cetera. We got to think about the planet, you know, not 10, 15, 25 years from now, but into the future. And it's going to start with individual um, decision making, uh, individual habit changing, and only with the changes in the policy will we be able to actually get a population to start changing those habits. And listen, I mean, it's chilly outside. I, I'd be the first to tell you if I had to sit there and wait for the bus, I'd be kind of freezing. But it's going to take a personal commitment for us to make sure that our our, our Earth is taken care of in the future. Hey, Stacy. what I would really like to see is all 11 members of the county council take public transportation for a damn month. Then we'd see how much they like it. You know, in reality, you know, while everybody is concerned about global warming, they're not, a, they're not on board with shutting down oil and gas production, paying higher prices for gas and electricity, and, major, and majorly, they're not uh, wanting to give up their automobile tra- travel. They love their cars. What do you think? Well, I think that this is part of the hypocrisy that we see in a lot of these policies, and particularly with this one, it's impracticable. Um, We're already seeing negative results of it down in D.C. where they're experimenting with it. And living in a car-free building doesn't prohibit you from owning a car. So what we're now seeing on the streets in D.C. is that people in those car-free buildings are parking in the nearby neighborhoods. And DC has experimented with zoning that um, if you live in one of those car-free buildings that you can't get a permit to park in that neighborhood, but it it doesn't work. People snub the law, they park where they want to. In some instances, they even double park with seeming insistence and insolence. And DC doesn't even care about shoplifters. So why would it take aggressive action on these scoff laws? I think that the, the bottom line is that for most people and to Marise's point, that it's cold out. You know, what if you have a child that's sick and you're you're relying on public transportation, but you don't have a doctor that's nearby? You know, these are the things that drive people to need to or want to have a car. You know, I mean, the automobile was one of the greatest inventions that opened up, you know, for, for people, the ability to have transportation and mobility and freedom. And this, this war on the car is, is, you know, really, it's an attack on poor people because rich people are going to are going to own their cars. They're going to live in the suburbs and they're not going to care. But it's it's really an attack on on the on the on the lower class and the poor who want and depend on their cars to get to their jobs and to and to have the economic freedom that they deserve. Marce, I, compl- any I, compl- 
Yeah, I completely disagree. You know, out of all the industrialized countries, the U.S. is really lacking behind in terms of using the technology that exists and that. And we also understand that, yeah, even though you we may be addicted to cars, we may be addicted to oil, there's going to be, there's going to have to be a shift. And if you look at any major industrialized country in any of the major cities, where, by the way, where young people are moving to, and that's where the future is going to be, um, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing to do with class. Um, I think with time and, and commitment, real commitment, seeing from federal, state, and county policy, which is what we're starting to see with this county council, I think we should be all proud that the county council unanimously is moving forward on this bill. Well, like I said, I want to see all 11 of those council members, you know, particularly the up county council members, start using the ride on buses. Because, you know, th then they'll have a different opinion about uh, uh, transportation. But I want to shift to another subject because over, you know, across the river, Alexandria County and their county council is as proposed of the elimination of single family housing and allowing up to four units being built on any any lot. Is that, a you know, you're talking about the concentration into neighborhoods. Marseille, what do you think about that? I think um, we are dealing with a housing crisis, not just in the DMV, but nationwide. We're seeing cities like Houston, San Francisco, um, dealing with massive homelessness. And this is a real problem. Um, even when you look at members of my generation, um, I was lucky enough to be able to purchase a home at the age of 30. But when you look at most of, of, of my peers, you know that is increasingly unattainable. Um, so I, I applaud Alexandria. Um, I'm also actually, for those of you don't know that don't know, even though I was uh, elected in the state of Maryland and also have my my bar license for the state of Maryland, um, I was born in Arlington County, and I remember, um, you know, even my parents discussing when um, 40 years ago, 35 years ago, the ca the county council, well, in Arlington, the county board in Arlington County was discussing whether to expand the Orange Line. Um, under, you know, underground or over 66, et cetera, et cetera. And now we see how it's benefited those, all those stops from Boston to Virginia Square to Courthouse to Clarendon. And that's where all the young people um, are looking to move and, you, you know, walkable communities. And I think Alexandria, um, thankfully, is moving in that direction as well. And I know that we in Montgomery County, we're also, you know, looking to um, expand housing in that way. And Again, we have to do it in a smart way, which is why um, these issues around parking and you know lessening the the use of just the roads that's that comes with creating walkable communities. So if you want to, well, you know, you know, I got I want I want to get Stacy in on this because <laughs> oh, you sure. know, Stacy, we saw this battle you know a year and a half ago uh, when we, when the Montgomery 2050 plan was you know being discussed. You know, why does Montgomery County want to turn into the Bronx? Well, the problem is it can't. It's very short-sighted for the county to think that it, they can do this. It's problematic, it's overly ambitious, and it's short-sighted. And I'm going to tell you why. That when you take a neighborhood that is not on a grid like you have in the Bronx or in Manhattan, where you have steady, reliable, you know, transportation is everywhere. You can jump on a bus, you can easily jump in a taxi or get on the subway. You cannot do that here. It's not laid out this way, and it would take massive changes to our infrastructure in order to accommodate the kind of aggressive, affordable housing program that the county wants overall. So on a short-sighted view, this looks like a good idea. The problem is investors will go in and buy those units, like it's a quad, and there goes the um, agency for that, or people are no longer stakeholders. They won't take as good a care of it. You'll have cards everywhere. It'll be a mess. Well, I, it's a, it's an interesting look. We have to do something about housing. I, obviously, it's it's an it's an it's a crisis. I saw, you know, I, I'm a transactional lawyer, and we did a closing on a on a property in in Bethesda just the other day. The ha cost of the new house was two point six million dollars. I mean, that's not un unreachable for most people. So we have to be able to find a way for. Marseille's peers who are in their 30s <laughs> to be able to find a house. I wish I was so lucky to be that young, Marseille. Anyway, <laughs> when we come back from this short break, more state money and more county money to provide security against hate crimes. And should businesses be required to pay for feminine hygiene products? Stay tuned after this short break. 
Welcome back. Over the past several years, the incidence of hate crimes against religious institutions has been on a dramatic rise. In the immediate aftermath of the Hamas attack, attack on Israel on October 7th, Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich authorized additional funding for security for local organizations and religious institutions. Now, Governor Moore has also released additional state funds in that effort. Mara say the Montgomery County Anti-Hate Task Force met this week and released its recommendation for the county to the county council. The proposal is largely centered around pushing the county council for more funding for anti-hate programs, improved translation and hate crime reporting, and improving anti-racism pro programs and education in the, in the in the schools. But is that are is it the government able to to change people's hearts and how they feel about other people? You know, that, that is the million dollar question, Casey. I think it's a good first effort, a good, uh, you know, strong step forward. Um, you know, be, having been a member of the legislature, I represented the areas of Kent Mill. And it's true, you know, even, um, you know, before the devastating events that we're, experience, that we're seeing happen um, now, um, unfortunately, these hate crimes have been on the rise. Um, you know, and it's and, and, and I'm thankful that we have leaders um, that are, you know, using the funds, state funds, uh, county funds um, to, to, to be to be able to educate and kind of, like you said, you know, change people's minds, change people's hearts. Um, and I think just looking at each other's humanity, um, no matter your, your faith, where you come from, I think is part of, um, you know, being being an American. And so this is something that, you know, I think we're all kind of processing. Um, that's why I'm, I'm inarticulate in this moment because it's it's really an emotional kind of you know it's really hitting at my heartstrings. Um, but I think changing changing hearts, you know, any effort, um, you know, is is good. However, if you know if somebody could come in with a magic wand and and, and you know automatically take people's hatred away um, because of whatever upbringing or erroneous ideas that they have, that would be great. But unfortunately, you know. We're human. Well, let, let, yeah. let's 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 bring Stacy in on this. Yeah. You know, Stacy, uh, Montgomery County is really blessed in its multiculturalism. I mean, we have we have you know it's one of the one of the strong points of the county. But according to a News Four uh, investigation, anti-Semitic incidents are at its highest level since 2016, when the police started tracking such crimes. You know, Mark Elrich had an interesting take on this. Uh, the only way to stop anti-Semitism is when we confront this in our communities, live and in person. We can't hide from this. I can build, I can't build walls high enough and strong enough to keep people from getting assaulted. You know, how do you, how are we going to address these issues? Are we, have we tolerated it? And now we have to, and, and not, we can't tolerate it any further. What do you, what's your thoughts? Well, we did touch on this the last time I was on your program. And um, I encourage this support. I think it's a good thing. I think it comes in some ways a little bit too late because it's part in my mind of the defund the police that we have less police protection out there, thus eyeballs out on the street, people monitoring what's going on. So the next best thing is having security cameras where it's live and is the closest thing to being live. We can see when these things or these acts are being perpetrated and hopefully catch the perpetrators that are doing it. Um, so as long as it doesn't violate civil rights, then it, to me, I approve of it. I think it's a, it's a good thing to do. I'm curious to know if they would give that money to the Republican party. <laughs> I would, well. you know, I would just put in my, my two cents. I think we're, we're colluding issues here. Uh, defunding the police in Montgomery County would never <laughs> defund the police. And if anything, um, you know, we are trying to mo modernize our criminal code so that we're not over policing certain communities. And if anything, um, if we're shifting our, you know, our resources well, to issues like hate crime, then we have resources that are, you know, that now are relinquished to be able to, 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 to address those issues. And so that we're not over policing certain communities um, and locking people up because of a color of the color of their skin. Um, well, I mean, this is, a this is a different topic than exactly what we were, what we were discussing before, which mm -hmm. is the, the anti the anti um, racism that's going on or the racism that's going on in the county and and how you and how you address it i mean it's not just anti-semitic racism there's there are racism you know but it's it, it, against other groups as well um the real question is 
we, if we're going to live in a multicultural society, how do we get along with one another? Stacey, I'll go to you first, and then uh, Mara say you'll have the last word. Casey, I wish I knew the answer to that question. As I said, the last time I spoke about this, I live in a community where on one end, there's a Muslim community center. We have multiple Jew, we have a synagogue, multiple Jewish education centers, a lot of Protestant churches, a Buddhist monastery, a Greek Orthodox parish and a Catholic parish. And I've been living here for nearly 20 years. We've gotten along. We learn to tolerate each other. So when I see the Jews going to the synagogue, you know, going to Sabbath, uh, walking with their families. I think it's a beautiful thing. I see the Muslims in my grocery store that are, you know, with their families. It doesn't, I don't think twice about it. They're just part of this community. The key thing, the underlying thing there is that this is a better educated community here. How do we educate? And that's the key thing. How do we educate that's tolerance? That's a great question. Mar Marcia, you have about 30 seconds to wrap it up. Actually, I, I I feel really great in my community. You know, I'm I represented the areas of Glenmont, Eaton, like I said, Kent Mill, um, and it, it seems to me like the that the isolated hate crimes that did that that I know that in, in the Kent Mill community, um, it was around high schools, et cetera. So some of, some of the, the issues that we're dealing with here, um, you know, I think it may be some of new members of the community, and I think starting young, starting individuals young not tolerating, but actually, um, you know, reaching across the aisle and understanding people's backgrounds. And I think, you know, I think for some of the older folks, it's too late, but starting them young, I think is, you know, I think would be the, the well, way to go. I think identifying <laughs> the issue and working to solve it, it takes a, uh, it's a great first step. We've got to go on to our last topic, which is council member uh, Will Juwando has introduced a bill that would require feminine uh, products, hygiene products like tampons and sanitary napkins to be provided at no cost in certain public accommodations, such as any business that offers a public restroom. So it's not just government buildings. It, would, uh, it applies to almost every restaurant and uh, almost every public office building or uh, building that has a uh, has public restrooms that you can use. Mara say the state requires the government facilities provide these products to state facilities, but should businesses be required? It's, it's not a question of whether they're not necessary. It's really a question of who should provide them. Sure. No, and, and this actually builds on a 2021 um, state legislation that already requires schools to provide feminine products. And um, I think, yes, you know, I, uh, we should question why from the, from the beginning of time, businesses haven't um, you know, they shouldn't have even been required to. And the reason is because women weren't at the table and the decision making and policies, et cetera. Right now that women are all throughout buildings, business, you know, public and private. Um, I absolutely believe that businesses should should. We're not second class citizens just because, you know, we are women um, and it's something that, you know, it's, un it's uncontrollable. Our bodies, you know, it's like the same reason why you would need, you know, um, when you go to the restroom when you need uh, hygienic products or anything else um so i think this is a, a no-brainer and i and I, I know that the business uh sector is gonna you know scream doomsday it's gonna be it's gonna bankrupt businesses i, I disagree um and i think a lot of um you know do-gooder type businesses are already providing uh feminine products well as i said it's not a question of of whether the products are necessary i mean i i have three older sisters i'm married to a wonderful woman and I have a daughter. So I understand that these products are absolutely necessary. Uh, Stacy, if public restrooms are required to provide other types of like toilet paper, isn't this just the logical next step? Uh, Bill and Eric say, I think this is one bill that promptly needs to get flushed down the toilet. Um, basic supplies like toilet paper and a means to dry your hands are sensible expenses, which are already baked into the cost of doing business. But adding feminine products, I mean, why would anyone bother to buy tampons or pads for themselves if they could just grab them for free in a business that's required to stock them up? And there's no accountability for that. And if you're providing free pads and tampons, why stop there? I mean, I'm sure the elderly feel like there's inequality in adult diapers. Why not provide those for free? <laughs> Was that, was that shot at me? No, no. We <laughs> even have condoms in all the men's rooms, and those yeah. are the public health. So I would say, hey, Will Juwanda, while you're at it, could you leave some hair hairspray and some Chanel Number no. Five in the ladies' rooms too? Like I said, <laughs> this one down the toilet. 
<laughs> well, I think it's a great, it's, you know, it all depends on uh, what your, uh, what your viewpoint is. Uh, when we come back from this uh, short break, stay tuned for Parting Shots. <laughs> Welcome back. Now with Parting Shots, Stacy Slaughter. As a representative of the Republican Party here in Montgomery County, I would like to fully encourage the voters out there to take a strong look at us this year. People that are not active, that are already registered Republicans and the independents as well. This is a really important year in politics. And we have a congressional race in, in CD6. We have a Senate race. We've got the presidential elections. We've got the school boards. So we have a lot going on. We have a lot of organizing to do. And we, I would welcome anybody that is interested in helping us to go to www.mcgop.com and look us up. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Marce Morales, your party shot. <laughs> Just leaving it on an, a light note, Casey, I know most of us are trying to close out the year. We have deadlines, et cetera. You know, just remember to breathe, guys. We're almost there. Um, spend time with your family this upcoming holiday season. And I can't believe it, Casey, but we're almost looking at the end of the year. I, I mean, I just remember from last, you know, it's, it's been a really, really quick year. And um, and yeah, just just enjoy, enjoy the time with your loved ones. Well, those, those are, that's a great sentiment. Uh, today is <laughs> December 1st that we're taping this show. And as we enter the follow, the last 31 days of the, of the year, uh, there's a lot going on. And I hope everyone uh, enjoys the holidays that, uh, that, are, that are soon to be upon us. I want to thank you both. I want to thank the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show. For 21 this week, I'm Casey Aiken.